Today, we have one of the biggest success coaches in the world. And the reason we're doing this and the reason we're getting these, these great success coaches and leaders from across different industries and from leadership industries in, in general is because this is a significantly strange time for all of us. Whether you're new to the industry, whether you've been in the industry for 30 years, these fireside chats are designed to help you experience success during this situation, but epic success coming out of it. And today, we have one of the biggest success coaches in the world. Jack Canfield is the co-creator of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. He has developed 42 New York Times bestsellers and holds a Guinness Book World Record for having seven books on the New York Times bestseller list simultaneously. Known as America's number one success coach, Jack has studied and reported on what makes successful people different. Over the last 40 years, his compelling message, empowering energy, and personable coaching style has helped hundreds of thousands of individuals achieve their dreams. He has been a featured guest on more than 1,000 radio and television programs, including The Oprah Winfrey Show, and he's been in nearly every major market worldwide. Without further ado, please welcome the great Jack Canfield. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being with us, Jack, and we really, really appreciate it. We know you're a busy man, uh, and you've got your new book, your, your uh, Success Principles Workbook, out now, and uh, we're really excited about that. And, and we're really excited to have you here because everybody's going through a really, really weird time right now. Obviously, we're doing this via Zoom, uh, a Zoom call, and, and so, you know, with everything that's going on in the world today, what's one of the things that you found that successful people do in times like these that others don't do or maybe didn't, weren't even aware that they could do? Well, what I find in times like these is most people go into fear. And when you go into fear, there's a lot of things that are not good about that. Number one, you hijack the prefrontal cortex of your brain. Fear, the blood all goes to the amygdala, which is in the back of the brain. And as a result of that, what happens is your rational thinking, and more importantly, is your creative thinking is not getting the blood in the brain that it needs to actually function correctly. So people that are super successful realize that fear is not the thing you want to do. The question is, how do you get out of that? Because there's so much news out there that so many people are watching, so many people are being told, you know, deaths are up, you know, economy's down, people are unemployed, people apply for government support and don't get it. Uh, nobody knows how long this is going to last. We don't know how long people are going to be sheltering in place and so on and so forth. And so there's a lot of data that if you're not careful, you spend a lot of time. And then it's not, it's not the data itself, it's how you respond to it. For example, I teach a formula called E plus R equals O. There's an event you have a response to that event and that produces an outcome. And your feelings are an outcome. So coronavirus, shutdown, you know, bad news, all that, then you have a thought about it, a story you tell yourself. That story or that thought is what produces the emotion called fear or an emotion called excitement. You know, I heard that Robert Kiyosaki went out and got a line of credit for $400 million because he knew a lot of properties would be sold in distress. And so for him, this is a huge opportunity. Whereas for other people, they see it as a terrible tragedy. And so I always say that, you know, what Napoleon Hill said is correct, that every negative event, every adversity, every heartache, every tragedy has within it the seed of an equal or greater benefit. And so if we look back on our lives, we can see those times when we might have been fired, when we uh, lost our job, when um, the, the technology changed and maybe something happened to us as a result of that. And at first, it seemed like it was a terrible thing. And then after a while, you realize, well, that was a good thing because eventually I found work I liked more. I found a better job. I'm happier now, found a better person, whatever it might be. But we tend to forget that in the midst of all that. So if we can remember that it's not the event, it's not the coronavirus, it's not the economy, it's not the president, it's not Justin Trudeau, it's not anybody. It's called, what is your response to that? I know we were talking before we came on air about some new tax laws. Well, that's just an event. And then people can move around that. I remember in the 2008-2009 uh, crash that happened, the whole economic crash, I was leading a workshop for uh, Remax franchise owners in New England. And uh, everyone was down about 30 or 40%, except one guy in the room. And he was up. And so I said, come up here. <laughs> I want to find out. You're, you're doing something different than everybody else. It's either mindset or it's skill set. So let's figure it out. It was mostly mindset. 
And what happens? Well, they said, so when you're talking to yourself, what do you say? Everyone else is saying, oh, there's, an, a, there's a recession. I better cut back. I better not spend so much money on ads. I, you know, maybe cut back on staff. He said, I tell myself, no matter what the economy is doing, I always do well. And just that mindset creates a different set of behaviors that come out of that belief. And so we have to literally take responsibility for the thoughts we're thinking and the images we're putting in our head. Are we imagining coming out of this or even being in it and, and doing, being successful? You know, I have a lot of friends who work with entrepreneurs and work with, you know, and, and every mortgage broker in a sense is a solo entrepreneur. Every real estate agent is a solo entrepreneur, even if you're working for a firm and, you know, you're, you're, income depends on your performance. And so what happens is one of my friends uh, out in Canada in Vancouver decided when all of a sudden his corporate consulting and entrepreneurial consulting kind of went dead because he couldn't put his workshops on. He said, how can I be of service? What can I do? How can I pivot quickly? So he started a show within one week. He had a show up where I was on it, but everyone you've ever heard of in this industry was on it over. I think he's in his seventh week now of doing this and he puts on an hour show. He has two or three speakers and he's increased his mailing list by about 10,000 people. Cause he tells says, tell your friends how great this was. Please come back. And he was talking, he brought on all these people who immediately pivoted in brick and mortar businesses and online businesses, consulting businesses, real estate, mortgage, whatever, and began to look at how can I turn this into a get to instead of a have to. And there are ways if you pivot that you can begin to do it. I mean, in my business, we had to cancel a whole bunch of workshops, postpone them into the future. Hopefully, you know, we hope by the fall this will be down, but, you know, people saying it might not. We then had to take a lot of our live trainings and do learn how to be really good Zoom people where we could take 400 people at a time, break them into breakout groups, break them into pairs, break them into small groups of four, put them into rooms of 20, whatever, music, all this kind of stuff. And it wasn't easy, but we did it. And what we found out from a lot of people, they actually appreciated more the intimacy of being in a private room with somebody than being in a room with 200 people talking to one person with all the you know, noise going on and whatever. And so we've now starting to offer live ongoing trainings for people on Zoom. And we're getting hundreds of people signing up who normally couldn't come to a live seminar. They weren't going to fly from Europe. They didn't have the hotel money, the visas, whatever they might've needed. So it's actually increased our business, not took it down, even though in the beginning we certainly had some concerns. So the idea is you want to, how do you get out of fear? Fear is, a, is created by imagining a negative future, imagining something bad happening. Even if there was a snake in your office right now and it was slowly slithering toward you, you would have to go into the future and imagine it biting you in order for you to be afraid. If you imagine it slithering out the door or it was a harmless garter snake or whatever, you wouldn't, it wouldn't bother you. So it's, it's what you imagine in the future. So we can replace the negative image, what we call worry, which is negative goal setting, with a positive image of the outcome we want. Someone once said the best way to predict the future is to create it. So then the question becomes, what are the principles and strategies of creating the future you want. We can talk about that if you'd like. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And maybe we'll go into that. And I think that that's, it's interesting because your success principles book has led into success principles, the workbook. And, yes. uh, and it sounds to me like a lot of the different things you're saying would be kind of ideal for somebody to almost write down or work through a workbook of. So is yes. that kind of what this is? Is that what you would recommend and, and, and writing those success ideas down? Yeah, first of all, I'll just show everyone, this is what it looks like. It's called the Success Principles Workbook. It is the follow-up to a book I wrote that became an international bestseller in 27 languages called the Success Principles, how to get from where you are to where you want to be. And right now, everyone's figuring out how do I get to where I want to be because I'm not where I want to be right now. And the reason I wrote the workbook, and it is a workbook, I almost called it Don't Read This Book. And then underneath it was going to say, Do This Book because it is a book you do. But the reason I wrote it is when I wrote this first book, I had literally thousands of people tell me they doubled and tripled their income. I had one guy who read the book and went from being homeless on a beach in Thailand to 14 years later being worth $3, 3, million, $3 billion. He's a triple billionaire. In the, he started out doing condo rentals 
And then he moved up into being a sales manager. And then he realized the people making the money were the people building the real estate. So he became a real estate developer. And now he develops properties and builds them for Hyatt and Renaissance and, you know, those kind of things. But from 19 homeless to 34, uh, $3 billion. And so we know that this stuff works if you work it. I always say the principles work if you always work the principles. The problem was a lot of people would take the first book, read it, tell me it was amazing, put it on their shelf. They'd end up with what I call shelf esteem, but they don't really have self esteem that comes from having high success. And so I said, all the people that go through our coaching programs and go through our live seminars, they're really achieving at a high level. What if we could put that coaching program in between the covers of a book so the people that didn't have the time, the money, or the inclination to go and work with a coach over time would get the same results? So we took a beta group of about 30 people, never been exposed to my work, weren't really into human potential work, gave them the manuscript, said, work through this for a couple of months. They did. They come back. Again, one person doubled their income in a couple of months. People got out of bad jobs, bad relationships, improved their time off, you know, on a week ago. But the point is, that's what that's about. And so you can literally work through the principles one at a time to create the future that you want. And what's so cool about this is I teach a formula. If you've ever opened a combination lock, you know you have to have the right numbers in the right order. The right numbers in the wrong order don't work. And a lot of people know a lot of these things, but they're not doing them in the right way, in the right sequence at the right time. And then there's people that are missing some of the numbers. Doesn't matter how hard you work, that lock will never open. So some people are doing some of the things they need to do for success, but they're not doing all of them in the right way. And that, this book literally walks you through 17 principles, which also have all these, um, I call them exercises to Velcro it to your subconscious mind and get on paper, a plan, a purpose, a vision, goals, affirmations, and then action steps, including asking for what you want, asking for feedback, moving forward, persevering, et cetera, to get where you want to go. It really is something in a couple of months as people are locked down, they can come out of this like riding a the surf, you know, like uh, some of these, like like Lloyd, Ham great, is that Lloyd, I can't remember Hamilton, Greg Hamilton, one of those guys who's a total surfer. You know, you see these guys surfing these 50 foot waves in Jaws and Maui. We all can be doing that with our careers. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's, that's an amazing point you bring up about, um, you know, having formulas and being able to work through the things that you want. And maybe we should lead into that and talk about, you know, sure. deciding what you want, because I think, you know, it's tough when you're, especially when you're in this kind of situation, if I'm a new mortgage agent and I'm questioning whether I should have even got into this industry just maybe even a few months ago. And now I don't even know what I want out of this because I don't know what it's going to look like in the end. Uh, let's talk a little bit about knowing what you want and and that's actually one of the most important principles in the book right so um, yes that's where we can start with that and then and lead in there from there well if you really go below the surface of what you think is possible and your intellectual beliefs about it given the time the economy etc and just ask yourself truly what do you want most people when it comes to their career have a financial goal something they would like to achieve in terms of the amount of money they would like to earn or the amount of clients they would like to have or the amount of deals they would like to do, but there's always something numerical. Now, be underneath that, there's something more powerful called freedom, time freedom, uh, family time, uh, hobby time, you know, travel time, whatever it might be. We want money in order to do something. Either it's just called be secure, or for most people, it's called have a life full of adventure and full of fulfillment, education, travel, memories, great experiences, education for my kids, good health, etc. So you want to look at what would your ideal life look like in seven areas of your life. So we have a vision exercise in the book where you are asked to look at your finances, your career, your relationships, your health and fitness, your um, fun and recreation, what we call personal, which would be things you want to own and things you want to do and personal development. And then finally, contribution and, and, and um, philanthropy. Because really, we all want to make a difference in somebody's life somehow. And you know, sometimes we do that simply by putting people in a great house, good for them, good for their kids, uh, good for our own kids. But usually we want to contribute to something else too, ending homelessness, ending hunger, you know, supporting people that are in need right now. I mean, there are so many philanthropy philanthropic organizations right now, they're trying to feed people, keep the doctors from getting sick, uh, you know, support people that are on the front lines, et cetera. So once you've determined, if you said, okay, one year from now, 
or you can go out further if you want. Say, if I had exactly what I wanted, every one of those seven areas, what would it look like? What would I be experiencing? And then we want to take that and, t- and I recommend people like literally take some time, like maybe a half hour and sit down and really go deep. Do it by yourself first. If you're in a relationship, then have your partner do it at the same time and then come together and create a, a set of visions for your, your relationship, for your family. So that you're all working on the same page because you don't want people working against each other. And then you want to turn it into specific measurable goals. How much by when? See, if I say I want to have a nice house uh, on the lake by a certain date, uh, that's, that's great. But if I don't say what lake, what road, how many square feet, how many square meters, whatever it might be, then my subconscious mind doesn't know what to do. So a lot of people say nice house on the ocean. Well, what's nice? Is it 3,000 square feet, 6,000 square feet? I literally was a co-owner of a house of 12,500 square feet on the beach in Hawaii. Three of us went in as investors and built this house. We built it as a spec house to sell it. And then we fell in love with it and we couldn't sell it. <laughs> so we were all going over there, you know, like a month at a time, three or four times a year, uh, different times. But the point being that you want to be very clear how much by when I want to lose weight. Well, how much by when I want to have this many clients, how many by when? Once you do that, and here, here's the real most powerful breakthrough I think people can do. It's what I call creating a breakthrough goal. What would be a goal that would quantum leap you? You know, Grant Cardone has this wonderful book called 10X. And the idea is like, what if you could 10X your income? And I remember when I first did that, I was making $600,000 a year. I thought there's no way I could make $6 million. But I did. And then I was in another workshop with Dan Sullivan, who you may know, who runs a strategic coach program, both in Toronto and in, in Chicago. And he said, I want you to commit to 10 xing your income. Well, I was making $6 million a year. And I said, my brain, like everyone's goes, no way. And then I said, well, wait, you're paying a lot of money for this guy to be your consultant way. So figure it out. Just commit to it. Do the work. This is what you teach. And within Two or three years, we sold Chicken Soup for the Soul for over $60 million. So, I mean, it was like, give me a break. This stuff works, you know. Um, Anyway, so the idea being that a breakthrough goal could be having your own radio show, having your own podcast, uh, doubling your income, 10 x your income, having a newspaper column, uh, doubling the size of your house, whatever it is. You want to have a goal that would quantum leap you in one of the seven areas. I think most people listening, it's in the area of professional or, or, or um, the area of finance. And once you've set that, the next trick is to actually believe it. And the tr- it, belief is a choice. Again, Napoleon Hill, who wrote Think and Grow Rich, said, if you can conceive it and believe it, you can achieve it. And as one of my friends said recently, as long as it rhymes, because everything Napoleon Hill said, <laughs> he liked phrases that rhymed. But the point being that you have to just, belief is a choice. Belief is a choice. You just choose to believe it. You act as if it's so. In other words, confidence comes from surviving a risk, but you can survive that risk in your imagination as well as you can survive it in the outer world. And so I remember when I first started giving speeches, I was very awkward. I was a little bit scared for sure. And the first couple I gave were to 30 people, 50 teachers in a school, whatever. And then one day I got an invitation to speak to the Boys Club National Conference, a thousand people, and to follow this guy named Norman Vincent Peale, who was this great, you know, speaker that everyone knew and uh, be like Tony Robbins today or something. So I was like really, really nervous. And I remember going into the restroom, going into the men's stall. I kept my clothes on, but I sat down on the toilet and I just visualized getting a standing ovation so that when I went out there, I'd already gotten a standing ovation. And when I went out there, I felt more calm because I'd already gotten the thing I was afraid I wouldn't get. And so we can visualize your goal, whatever that is, how many clients, how much money, what would be the image you would see out through your eyes? Would it be a bottom line on your tax return? Would it be a check written to you for a million dollars from a client? Would it be uh, your, your book cover in the window, you know, the whole window of a bookstore, all covers? I remember we did that with Chicken Soup for the Soul. We actually had a bookstore I went to and the entire window was full of chicken soup books. At that time, I think we had about a hundred different titles. So, but I had visualized that long before I saw it. As my partner used to say, visualizing is realizing. The problem is most of us have heard these tools. We know about them, but we don't do them. And, you know, that's, it's like having the greatest tool chest 
you know, I bought this uh, big tool chest where it has all these tools, all these drawers you pull out in the garage, you know, you can fix anything. But if I don't use them, it's just sitting there, you know, looking good, but not doing anything. So we've got to do take the actions to actually bring it into, into fruition. You bring up a great point about, about sort of taking action from, from learning. And we're all about lifelong learning. That's what we do. Um, you know, we've, we constantly are adding new content as the world of world mortgages and mortgage brokering changes. Mm -hmm. But if you don't use it, if you don't actually put it into action, um, you know, it's not going to help you as much as it could, right? And so what would you say to, and where we see this the most, we usually see new, new agents are pretty eager because they they're maybe not making that much money. They really want to try something new and see if it works. We also have members who have been in the business for 30 years and oftentimes without sort of knocking them, they'll complain about the way the business is, how it used to be. It was much easier to do a mortgage back in the day and they'll watch things like this and, and they'll, they might kind of give it a try day one and then maybe get back into that attitude. What would you say about attitudes like that and, and why you're maybe not growing your business uh, when you've been in it for so long? Well, two things. Changing habits is really, really hard. It's much easier to teach a new behavior to a young person than it is to teach an older person who's got old habits to do something new. Uh, I remember when I just, uh, my dentist said to me once, said, you don't have to floss all your teeth, just the ones you want to keep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's, that's good. Anyway, he got to me. I said, okay, I'm going to floss my teeth. And um, it took me about two to three months before that became a habit. You know, I do it for five days, and then I forget. And I do it for three days, and then I forget. And then pretty soon I wasn't doing it all. And then I'd go see my dentist again to get a cleaning, and he'd remind me to do it. Anyway, there's research that shows it takes about 66 days to change a habit. And there's research that shows it takes about 30 to 35 days to change an attitude, a change of belief. And so it's the repetition factor. And it's, 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 and here's the part that's really tricky. If you do something for 22 days and you miss a day, day 24 is day one again. It's kind of like Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, you're sober for five years, you have a drink the next day. You haven't been sober for five years in one day, it's one day. You got to start all over. And the reason for that is the brain is building new neural pathways so that when you hear something or see something or think of something, you go down this new pathway to do a new behavior, think a new thought, visualize something new, whatever. And when you don't develop that strong enough, think about going bowling. If you throw a ball down the bowling alley and it goes in the gutter, I've never had it bounce out of the gutter. You know, it just stays there and you go, I didn't get any points. Um, and so what happens is we have gutters in our brain. And gutters are those habits of thinking. You start to tell a joke. You tell it the exact same words every time because you told it 54 times. It happens to speakers where we do the same thing if we're not careful. And so what happens is you've got to be willing to, I call it, try on new behaviors. Just lean into it. And do it for a minimum of 30 to 60 days, 30 days if it's a new thought, like an affirmation. Uh, you know, I can, I'm happily earning and investing, you know, um, $300,000 a year. If you were making $100,000 before and you want to make $300,000 now. So you, you do that affirmation. If you do that about 30 days without missing it, your brain begins to, the, it, it, it informs the subconscious mind to come up with solutions. See, here's the thing that's interesting. And then we'll talk a little more about, about mindset. What happens is you have a part of your brain called the reticular activating system. It's in the lower brainstem. Right now, you're not aware of what you're feeling in your right foot. But as soon as I say that, everyone listening to this can feel what's going on in their right foot. Well, why did that change? Well, you have this little filter in the bottom of your brain that says, while this information, this sensation is streaming up the spine into your brain, it's called not important. I'm listening to this podcast. And so what happens is that it, it knows how to filter out that which is not important. Well, how do you determine what's important? If you have a goal and you visualize that goal as complete over and over and over for a minimum of 30 days, it, it reprograms that little reticular system to let into your awareness things that will be resources and solutions to your problems. For example, have you ever bought a new car? And then the next week you see that car everywhere. It's like everyone's driving a Prius or everyone's driving a Ford or whatever it is you just bought, you know? Uh, and, and so it's interesting. Like if you've ever had a major appliance break 
you know, you open up the newspaper and all of a sudden there's sales for refrigerators or washers or dryers or whatever. And you go, wow, my lucky day, my appliance breaks, and there's a sale. Well, every day there's sales. You don't see them because it's being filtered out because it's not important to you. So what we want to do is program that with our vision of what we want. So our mind actually perceives resources, ideas, and opportunities from the outside and the inside creative subconscious that it never saw before. I set a goal to make $100,000 a year when I was making $8,000 a year, eight with three zeros, way back in the 1970s when I was learning this stuff from W. Clement Stone, one of Napoleon Hill's friends, uh, ran an insurance company, became a multi-billionaire. And so what happened is that I did not know how to do that, but I, I created a $100,000 bill, I drew one, put it on the ceiling. Every morning I wake up, I'd see it, I'd close my eyes, I'd visualize this. About day 28 or 30, I'm in the shower, I had my first $100,000 idea. And it turned into, a, I did not make $100,000 a year, I made $92,000, but I went from 8,000 to 92, based on the reticular system, starting to come up with creative solutions, seeing things in my environment I never saw before. Etc. I won't go into details because of time, but it's a story I often tell when I have more time. But I, I've done the same thing for a million dollars. If I was, if this was a seminar, I'd show you my million dollar check that I got from my publisher. First million dollar check he ever wrote. He actually put a smiley face in his signature. It was really cute. Uh, he was very happy to write that because for every dollar I made, he made three. So he was he he, he has a private jet right now, uh, which is I think I helped pay for. But the point being that. You literally need to do the, the mindset change and realize that you, you're, there was a book written called Mindset by Carol Dweck, and she talks about the growth mindset and the fixed mindset. And if you don't think you can continually grow and get better, uh, then you're not going to try on new things and you're going to bemoan and complain. I was just working with the company last year called Cheapo Air. It's kind of like Expedia.com and you can get really cheap air flights on there. And it's a company run by Indians, uh, you know, from the country India in New York. They're citizens of America, but they come from India. And they have a problem in their company or did before I got there, where they had the older people up here who'd run the company for many, many years. And then all these new young programmers that, because they were expanding so fast. And the young people had all these great new ideas and the old people said, why rock the boat? And it was creating a huge tension within the company. And eventually we were able to get the older people to see the value of the new people and get the new people to see the value of not going too fast because you have to like have stability. And those are the kind of things that happen continually. But literally, I'm 75. Uh, I read at least a book to three books a week. I take some idea out of that. I try something new. I've learned to do Zoom calls. I'm now doing Facebook Lives, which I started two weeks ago. I never did them before. And today, one of my staff is teaching me how to do Instagram Lives uh, because one of the, the people that is one of my students uh, who became a trainer under me uh, has 12,500 people in her Instagram following. And we're going to go on air. She's going to do a live interview with me and hopefully we'll sell 5,000 of them a book. And so if I didn't learn how to do that, I literally would not have that opportunity to take advantage of what's available now. And yeah, would I rather just go online like you and talk to you and just have everyone go to amazon.ca or amazon.com and buy my book? Sure. Does that work for the millennials? Not a, not a chance. Yeah, very, very true. Very, very true. And those are great points. And it's just about sharpening your axe all the time. And, and I hear, hear this all the time, stay in the learning lane and, and just understand you don't know everything and, and visualizing and, and, and changing your attitude and your outlook and your vision of your life is, is something that you have to develop a habit for, for sure. But right. uh, at the same time, just so, so important. Um, it's interesting. You, you have a tutorial in your book that I think would really apply to our newer mortgage agents because right now, and especially right now, they have um, the tendency to be afraid to ask for things. Um, and they're getting even more of that nowadays where they don't want to look like they don't know what they're doing at home. They don't want to look like they don't know how to sell. Uh, and even in some forums, they're being told by veteran mortgage brokers oh, you should probably leave the business right now because it's so bad right now or it's going to get really bad and you really shouldn't have done this and they're being told to work for places like Uber Eats. How do you respond to something like that or someone like that? How can we ask sort of for help with confidence instead of awkwardness? 
Well, that's one way to get rid of the competition. Tell younger people not to stay in the business. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> Very uh, true. You know, but the, the thing about asking is this. Um, I'm going to recommend another book besides my own. It's called Go for No. And the idea is most people are afraid of hearing the word no. And some people down in Florida wrote a book called Go For No. You can find it online. I recommend it to everybody um, because I, I wrote a book called The Aladdin Factor, How to Ask For and Get Everything You Want in Life, which basically the, one of the biggest uh, challenges is the fear of hearing the word no. And uh, no is just a stepping stone to a yes. Uh, in, in every business, there's some average. Like, you know, for every 10 people you talk to, you get a yes. For every 25 people you talk to, you get a yes. If you're selling airplanes, it might be every 100 people you talk to, you get a yes. Um, so th there's, there's that kind of industry average. And most people, after they get a few no's, they just get discouraged. With Chicken Soup for the Soul, we got 144 publishers telling us no before we had one that said yes. Howard Schultz, when he started Starbucks, before he had the first investor, he had 217 private investors and banks and uh, mortgage, you know, investment firms turn him down before he got a yes. Well, what if he'd stopped at 200? There'd be no Starbucks. I might make Tim Hortons very happy, but the fact is, you know, uh, Starbucks is kind of like McDonald's. We know, we know about it. So the reality is that uh, you have to be willing to hear no. Uh, there's a wonderful phrase in a book called SWSWSWSW. It stands for some will, some won't, so what, someone's waiting. There's always someone out there who needs what you're doing, and you have to find them, and that's called prospecting. It's called going out and talking to people. I have a story uh, in the original Success Principles book about a chiropractor who literally knocked on 12,500 doors, talked to 6,500 people over the course of two months when he started to open his practice. He said, before I open my practice, I'm going to go out and meet people and let them know I'm a new doctor in town. And this was a town where the chiropractic association said, we don't need any new doctors. We're, we're full up. We got one chiropractor for every eight people, but he wanted to live in Pebble Beach, California, where they have the big golf course there. So he, they, he decided he wanted to do it. And uh, his first month in practice, he made $72,500 and he made over a million dollars in his first year because he had created a relationship with people talking to them on their front porch, getting their email addresses and so forth. And then letting them know he had a big open house the first month and on and on. But the point being that you have to be willing to ask, 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 ask. I, I, you, I, I coined a term called the become an ask hole. You want to just be willing to ask, 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 and know that you're going to get a no. When I do my live seminars, I have like three or 400 people in the room. I have them all stand up. I'll say, I want you to think of five things you could ask for that would help you achieve your breakthrough goal. Could be five people you think of asking or five things like, will you loan me money? Will you babysit my child so I can go out? Will you, um, you know, buy my property? Will you, you know, hire me as a coach? Whatever it might be. And they go around and everyone has to say no to the first nine people that ask them something. So I'm asking you a question. You say no. You ask me for something. I say no. We go find someone else. But what happens all of a sudden when we get up to the nine, ten area, everyone's getting yeses. And some people go two or three rounds before they get a yes. Some people get five yeses. Some people get one yes, but everybody gets a yes. And what they realize is just a numbers game that it's not personal, that people, they weren't in a position to say yes, but someone was. And so we learn that it's okay to hear no. And so what I love about this book, Go For No, is that you make a goal for how many no's you want to get today. So let's say I want to get 30 no's today, which means you're going to call 30 people or talk to 30 people. And the exciting part about it is every time you get a no, you go, yeah, another no, instead of, oh, another no. Because you know you're on your way to a yes. And I remember when we started selling chicken soup for the soul, we were calling up multi-level marketing companies, network marketing companies, because we knew it would motivate them to, to, you know, to go for their dreams and all that. And I must have got hung up on five times, told never to call back. But then about the, I don't know, 21st call, someone from Discovery Toy said, send us a copy. She bought a thousand copies for her top leaders, invited me to speak at their national conference for $25,000 speaking fee. So the reality is all those no's led to a wonderful yes, and that continued to happen. So make a list of all the people that you could ask for something. What are the things you need to ask for, both personally and professionally? And then just spend time. You're sitting at home anyway right now. So instead of watching, you know, Breaking Bad season five for, you know, the next week, go ahead and spend some time uh, reaching out to people. This is a great time to study, 
to learn, to develop new habits, and to also be reaching out to people using a new technology. You've got a phone, you have Skype, you've got Zoom, lots of ways. And the other thing I would say to everybody, find a way to be of service. Right now, if you're of service to people during this time, by giving them information, providing them with whatever you have, it could be entertainment, it could be information on, you know, I've just been studying all the vitamins and minerals and things you can take that, that boost your immune system. Nobody has to get COVID-19 if your immune system is strong enough. And we know there are certain nutritional factors. Don't eat sugar, don't drink alcohol, uh, don't eat gluten, uh, and things like that. We know that certain vitamins like D3 and zinc, and I won't go into this, making this a wellness seminar, but if you had information that you can share with people online, like on a call like this, whatever, like we're doing here, what happens is people come out of this and they go, oh, he's the guy who helped me. There was a woman realtor during uh, the recession who realized I'm not going to be selling as much real estate right now. So she started educating women on how to buy your first home. These were young college graduates, graduate school graduates, and maybe, you know, recently single moms, et cetera. And they didn't know how to buy a home. They didn't think they could buy a home. And she showed them how they could do that. And when the, when the, when the market came back and people started having some income, guess who they asked to be their realtor? Well, her, of course, because she had a relationship with them. One of my friends who's a mortgage broker is going back to all of her people who just recently bought a home and saying, hey, this home you bought, you've been sequestered in it now for like two or three months. Was it big enough? You know, when you got three kids and two adults both working at home, three kids homeschooling, only got two bedrooms, everyone's screaming and yelling and you're trying to do a business call. Maybe you'd like a three bedroom house. Well, great time to do that right now. Um, so but there's a lot of things you could be doing that, you know, take a little creativity. But if you come up from service and people get that you're there to serve them, uh, it's all going to come back to you multiplied. What I wanted to uh, ask you a little bit about is uh, obviously Chicken Soup for the Soul was wildly successful if you were able to sell it for $60 million. And that's amazing. Congratulations on that. Let's Thank talk you. about achieving the success that you've just talked about envisioning, about working toward. Uh, it's no wonder that the Success Principles is, is you know, the number one success book out there. What is it like when a book gets there and, and how does it feel to achieve the success you'd been visioning? As good as you can imagine. Uh, no. <laughs> well, first of all, you're like a little kid. I remember every week buying the New York Times. I lived in LA at the time when it first came out and uh, Chicken Soup, but I, there was an international newsstand about five blocks from my house and I would buy the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Dallas, and I'd look to see if we were on the bestseller list. And it took us 14 months before we did hit a bestseller list. That's one of the things most people give up too soon. They think it should be an overnight success. And, um, you know, I have a very, very nice life right now. I live in a 6,000 square foot home on three acres. We have all the toys you could possibly imagine, including guest houses and a barn and horses and all these wonderful things. Uh, but it wasn't like that always. I mean, I can remember living in a, you know, a, a one bedroom apartment where the Murphy bed came out of the wall. And then when you put it up, you couldn't get back to your clothes because they were hanging behind the bed, you know, and when it was down, you couldn't move around. And uh, it was like really bad. And uh, then really a small house, you know, 1700 square foot house, and then with a kid and so forth. Um, but when the book took off, first of all, the game of it, like every week seeing, was it climbing up on the bestseller list? And then when I started to get some royalty checks, you know, first ones for $100,000 and then like for 500, and then I got a, I got a check for $1,325,000 for three months royalty. So that year, Mark and I, my co-author, each made over $6 million. And that changed my life, not only in terms of income, which allowed me to have all the goodies in my life and be able to send my kids to good schools and colleges and have the best medical care on the planet and be able to afford all the supplements that a lot of people think they should take, but they think they can't afford them. It, but it, the other thing it did was it gave me this tremendous sense of gratification that I'd touched so many lives. I mean, just, just recently, I got an email from a kid who read the Success Principles book. He's 15 years old. And he sent me an email. And he said, my mom bought your book. My mom does not read books. So I wondered what the heck was she doing with your book? So when she wasn't reading it, I stayed up all night and read your book. And actually, it was two nights because it's a long book. And he said, uh, I was getting Fs in school. 
I was cutting classes. I was flunking everything. I was smoking dope. I was drinking alcohol. I was going out in the playground and, and on, on school breaks and smoking cigarettes and dope and everything. And he said, now I'm hanging out with a totally new group of kids because we teach, you know, the, 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 you were the average of the five people you spend the most time with. He really got that. And he realized he was headed for like gang membership or worse. And he said, I'm getting A's and B's in all my classes. I'm doing really, really well. Thank you for your book. And that's the thing, more than the money uh, that really gets me happy. I remember Mark Victor Hansen and I, co-author on Chicken Soup, were in New York. We were walking through a lobby. We saw this girl with a bald head. She was probably about 11. And uh, I went over and I said, you know, I'd like to send you a book. I wrote a book called Chicken Soup for the Cancer Survivor Soul. Would you be interested in getting one? She said, I've already read it. She said, it's that that keeps me going through my chemotherapy without feeling depressed. And it's like the whole family just wanted to take pictures with us and get our autographs. And you realize you're making that kind of difference. That's what really is the, the thrill of it. And then I started getting invited to places like the Women's Caucus of the United States Congress, which includes all the women governors and all the women senators and congressmen. And I said, what do you want me to talk about? And they said, the legislation you think we should be passing. I'm thinking, little old me, I get to I get to tell them that, you know. So it just changed my life in a million ways. But I would say the greatest thing is just knowing it it's made a huge difference in the lives of so many people that otherwise would be homeless, would be not successful, would be in lousy marriages, would not be happy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're living proof that one person can change the world, right? And there's so many people that are told that they can't. And um, and that's just that's just an incredible story. And thank you for sharing that with us because we, you know, obviously people want to vision their success, but they also want to know what, it, what it's like to achieve it. Um, one last question. You talked about uh, a little bit about surrounding yourself with five people. They are, you're the average of your five people. So surrounding yourself with success and with successful people. Can you talk a little bit more about that briefly just before we finish up? Yeah, I think one of the things that is the hallmark of highly successful people is they usually belong to something called a mastermind group. Group of people that they meet with either formally or informally. We've formalized it in our work. We teach people how to form mastermind groups, how to run them, how to be in them. Uh, but a lot of people just naturally gravitate to other people, you know, the Henry Fords of the world hanging out with the Goodyears and the Thomas Edisons and so forth, because they all had mansions down in Florida in the winter. And they all helped each other figure out how to build these incredible businesses like General Electric and so forth, and Ford Motor Company and Goodyear Tires. And, and, but I think for most of us, just having five other people that are committed to success it can be five people in the same industry, real estate, mortgage, investing, things like that. Or they could be people in totally different industries because then you're getting perspectives and ways of thinking that other people might have that you wouldn't have. So normally a mastermind group meets about once every two weeks. More than that kind of gets uh, to be arduous. Uh, once a month is enough if, if you want. And you brainstorm. Everybody gets 10 minutes to talk about challenges and everyone brainstorms solutions and opens up, I'd say, used to say their Rolodexes, now their contact list uh, to people so they can you know, introduce people to who they need to meet. Um, and the other thing is I think everyone who's a solo entrepreneur should have an accountability partner, somebody that you talk to once a day and you commit to five action steps. We have this thing in the book called the rule of five. You need to do five things a day to achieve your breakthrough goal. Five actions, no matter what. Five, they can be small, they can be big, but they're five things a day. Because if you went to a tree, you mentioned sharpening your ax earlier. If you went to a tree with a sharp ax, I don't care how big that tree is, if you took five wax every day with your ax, eventually even the largest red, redwood tree would have to come down. It might take months and months, but it would eventually come down. And so five actions a day equal about 18 hundred actions a year, a little more than that. And so if you're doing that, you're going to get successful. And so having that accountability partner, if you and I were accountability partners, I would call you in the morning and we would spend no more than five minutes on the phone. I would tell you what my five behaviors of the day are that I'm going to do. You'd tell me your five. We get off the phone tomorrow. I tell you if I achieved them or not, no excuses, just did I or not, not. And then you tell me, are you willing to recommit to those two if I didn't do it? The thing that's powerful about that is that it's like if the Canadian government said, send in your taxes whenever you wanted, no one would ever get around to it. But they set a date. And because you have a deadline, you have to do it. And so when you have this deadline of five things a day, it gets really embarrassing to tell each other, well, I didn't do it again. I didn't do it again. Finally, it's just too embarrassing. I do it. 
And so I keep moving forward in doing those things that are the uncomfortable things, because most of us do what's comfortable and easy and not that significant, put off the more significant, difficult, long range success things. Uh, and so uh, that's why it's important. And, and also, uh, W. Clement Stone, my mentor said, make a list of the five people you spend the most time with, or even the 10 people, and then put a plus sign next to everyone who's a positive person, minus sign next to everyone who's what he called a psychic vampire. They pull your energy down. And uh, then he said, stop spending time with anyone who has a minus sign next to their name. And my mother had a minus sign next to her name. And he said, Christmas and Easter, that's it. <laughs> you know, don't spend time on the phone with her. Because she used to like bring me down until I learned. I, don't, I now don't let anyone bring me down, but it took a while to learn how to do that. But that's why it's so important. And we call it dropping out of the ain't it awful club. Surround yourself with positive people. And there's a whole chapter on how to do that in the book. That's amazing. That's amazing. And that book, again, is the Success Principles Workbook. Highly suggest you read the Success Principles first, I assume, because this is, as you said, a, a do not read. It's a do book. You want to... Um... Two things. You can actually... There's enough, there's enough uh, information in this book about the principle, like a page or two, that doesn't require you to read the first book. I recommend you read the first book. I think it's, it's a lot more principles or 64 principles versus 17, but these are the core. This is enough to get you where you want to go. But if you really want to be a superstar, then eventually you want to read this. So if you buy them both together, I think on Amazon, they've grouped them together. You get them for less money if you buy both of them at the same time. Great, great. And we'll be sharing the links as well at the bottom of this video when it's uh, up on the site. So we're really, really excited about that. And I know I can probably speak on behalf of the entire Canadian mortgage industry when I say thank you very much for all the extra time you gave us today, but even just any time you gave us. Uh, this, this call has been jam-packed with information and takeaways that people can use, and we really, really appreciate it. I'm truly grateful for that. Well, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity to share.